Welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture, guaranteed to spice up your relationship with God. I'm your host, Stephanie Roussel, and here is today's episode. Well, Andy Ashworth and Charlie Peacock, welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast. Thank Thank you, you Stephanie. So glad to be with you. Okay, so I'm a little intimidated right now, I have to say, because the book we're going to discuss today, um, it really got in under my skin in the best possible way. So you wrote a series of essays, each one of you taking turns on different topics. And so I'm going to start by some of my favorite chapters. I read the whole thing, not fast not too fast, but probably too fast. So I'm going to go back and read it again when I have more time. And so Charlie, can we start with you maybe if that's okay. And I want to, we're going to go through several of the chapters and you, my jaw just dropped at some point in the book, because you basically quote something that is a sentence that we have raised our children on my husband and I, ever since they were little, it's actually so meaningful to us that on our ministry, Gospel Spice, we literally have merch that says that, and you literally have the quote in your book. And I'm like, oh my goodness, oh, that was so I exciting. Can, so can, you say, our is quote it? is, there's nothing you can do for God to love you more. There's uh, nothing you can do for God to love you less. Right. And we've always said as parents, we're hoping on a good day, we can say that about ourselves to our kids. Mm-hmm. obviously our love cannot ever be fully unconditional it's always complicated but with god it's true and i mm-hmm. know i've spent the better part of three decades figuring out what it means but you literally say and you call this one of your pearls and sparks and we'll get to that mm-hmm. that's going to be part mm-hmm. of my question you say grace is sufficient for every sin and error and love is so supreme and unconditional that there's nothing you can do to make god love you more or love you less Mm-hmm. I love this so much. So this is what you call a pearl, pearl and a spark. Can you tell us what pearls and sparks are and maybe what they have to do with what, with what you call oceans of possibilities? Mm-hmm. Yes, I, well, I'm speaking there, uh, I think in the letter to artists, um, but it really is a letter to all uh, followers of Christ. And um so we we each have um, as our vocation uh, an ocean of possibilities. We, we'll never get to all of them, but they do. They are there in the same way that we stand at the seashore and observe observe the ocean and its grandness and vastness. There is a vastness to the potentiality or human potentiality, and it's not because of us. Uh, per se, it's because of our creator. It's it's because of what uh, the image of God that's embedded in us, the power of imagination and creativity. And so one of the, the basic pearls that sparks great creativity is freedom. And um, the world has an idea about freedom that is so much more about the autonomous individual. Whereas a person who follows Christ, their freedom is constructed of something that is imparted to them. It's given to them. It is a gift of grace. And um, one of the ways that you are able to experience um, the most open, beautiful, wide freedom is through understanding grace. Uh, Because if you know that God's love for you is secure, then you are able to risk and you're able to dream dreams that may seem too extravagant for you. They may be too grand, right? Um, you don't have anything left to prove. Everything's been proved for you. You don't have to do anything to make God love you. You can just live in this place of freedom. And then even if you don't achieve what your big dream is, um, then you're free to accept that. You're free to say, well, 
yeah, I guess it just, the timing wasn't right. It's not what God has for me right now. But just that ability to go way, way out into the ocean of possibilities or come way, way back in to just say, I'm just one small little human in the cosmos, right? To have that kind of perspective, that is um, a pearl to, to which uh, all great treasure <laughs> is formed out of. And that to me is what has held our marriage together. It's held, it's been the foundation of my artistry and it's the way that we've tried to raise our children as well mm. as you guys are <clears throat> clearly. You said that we don't necessarily, you know, achieve all of the dreams in that ocean of possibilities. What do you think heaven is going to offer in terms of oceans of possibilities? Do you think that maybe those dreams we are not fulfilling on this side of heaven or for the other side? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do believe that everything that is good, whether it's thought or enacted, uh, has a place in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, that is at the heart of it. So because we are living in... in uh, a time when all our best efforts are tinged with sin, all our best efforts are proximate, you know, none of them reach the 100%. You know how on Instagram, we all put the 100% or put fire or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, you know, it, it's a spark. It's definitely a spark. And it might be 99%, you know, but it's, it's never 100 Mm -hmm. um, and we all live with that. And I think part of that, the, the beauty of that, uh, of sort of missing the goal is knowing that we are people of expectation. There is something embedded in us in the image of God that has an expectation for the fullness of goodness. And so I do believe the new heavens and new earth will be that fullness of goodness. Yeah, yeah. And to dream ambitiously within the framework of God's spirit and presence is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. It's, that's why I get, um, it makes me very sad when I see um, Christians denigrate um, what is functionally godly ambition, or when they denigrate the accumulation of skill and ability. Uh, it could even be people who denigrate uh, theological studies or something like that. You know, I remember when we were really young Christians, they used to call a seminary cemetery, you know, okay. as, a, as a, like sort of, we didn't know, but we heard people around us like okay. denigrate, like the idea of, of getting a, a theological education as if it were sort of you know, a dead effort, you know, dead on arrival, like, like it was completely unnecessary. And that was really a product of the time in the late 1970s and early 80s. Um, but we don't believe that. I mean, we, we believe that, um, that God has called us to lifelong education, uh, to learn um, anything and everything everywhere in as much as he opens those worlds to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You do say one of the quotes I'm going to remember from the book is be where you are and go where you're sent, which is what mm -hmm. you're saying. Just be fully involved in what you're doing. I have a good friend um, who's getting a little older, Jill Briscoe. I don't know if you're familiar with her and how much you know her, yes. but she says, yeah. You know, she says, just go where, go where God sends you, go where you're sent and just minister there. That's one of her mm -hmm. mantras. And it's just so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. you, you're talking about, and Andy, I want to get to you, but just one follow-up yeah. question. I, I'm telling mm -hmm. you, we could spend hours. I have so much content that I've just learned and soaked from your book and your wisdom. So I'm trying to draw out the wisdom for everyone listening or watching right now mm -hmm. so that they too want to tune in to what you're doing and read the book, which is so full of wisdom. I felt, um, how can I say this? It felt a little bit like some spiritual parents who were writing to me. I mean, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I could be, I'm, you could be my parents age wise. And so it really mm -hmm. felt like I was gleaning the wisdom of your generation, your 
uh, expansive experience of working for the kingdom but and that's my follow-up question i guess maybe not necessarily in what people would call a christian way or explicitly christian and mm -hmm. so um you have an entire essay charlie on what it means to be a christian artist quote unquote and how you actually mm -hmm. don't like that term do you want mm -hmm. to tell us how as christians we can be these agents of love and fruitfulness and goodness in the world without necessarily having that label stamped on our foreheads yeah i think every uh, i would like you know every one of my brothers and sisters that professes to follow christ to just ask the question and ponder for a moment what would it be like if you lived in a world where you couldn't declare that you were a christian how would that change the way that you acted and spoke um because there are people in the world who who do live under those circumstances, and yet they are completely authentically Christian. And so uh, what I found out through being involved in uh, contemporary Christian music was that the power, um, you know, the last 40 years has built this um, uh, sociological need for niche branding. And so it, everything is is an opportunity to be to brand right uh and to, to create a mission statement for and so on and so forth and when it comes to being god's uh musical artist it's just too big um to belong to a brand alone it's not to say that you can't participate in a community you know that has a name or that calls themselves christians in as much as we do when, when we go to our Sunday fellowship with other Christians, of course, the, it's all contextual. So when when I argue for myself not using the word Christian words Christian musician, it's because I don't want to be branded according to this brand and genre of music called Christian music. It's not that I don't sometimes participate in it. I do. But I participate in all kinds of music. And so anything that might restrict me from being faithful, and I think that's the principle at stake for everyone, regardless of whether they're an artist or a musician, is that if there's anything about Christian naming that restricts you from faithfulness, you should do your best to avoid it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Especially in a culture where that very word Christian has the meaning is just so different or it means, I mean, obviously epistemologically, like it just means so many different things than what exactly. we think, how we're expressing it. So use words that cannot trigger uh, darts your way, if you can help it. That's right. And, and trigger assumptions that you don't embrace. Um, exactly. Like for example, we could have right now, we could have a conversation where because of your understanding and your empathy and your curiosity, I might say to you, well, of course I'm a Christian musician based on what you've told me, based on what your understanding is, right? And that's a one-on-one -on -one relationship because we've built that safety, right? And uh, my desire is to be accurately known your desire is to be accurately known. And so we accurately know each other. And now we have a, a bridge of safety and we can use these words and they mean something. But you get out on the street, it's a completely different circumstance. It is. It is. Uh, yeah, my family has only lived in the States for eight years at this point. And this actually is the first time in our lives that we're in a setting where, well, at least eight or 10 years ago, it was okay to be openly Christian. Not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. Things have really changed but we when we used to live in muslim countries or in atheist countries and it, as you're describing it it was a very loaded statement we had to be really cautious who we shared this information with because yes. of the 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 true risk of being misunderstood uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and you're saying one of the great ways to do that is through building relationships and one of the best ways to do that and andy i'm, I'm turning to you a little bit is the spiritual gift that you've um, displayed for countless decades at this point of hospitality and generosity so tell us how you have hard or how god has hardwired your life with this desire this 
this people-centered desire to love through hospitality, generosity, cooking, among mm-hmm. other things. Tell us mm-hmm. about all those things. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it started with, with really with our uh, the beginnings of our life in following Jesus. And we lived in a little house that we rented. We had been through a very difficult beginnings of our young marriage, got married very young, went through some hard things. And we came to this place where we began to see with different kinds of eyes. And we were both so grateful to have this little house and to have our children, to be together, to have each other. And both of us were stirred to, we just were so grateful. We want to share what we have. It was as simple as that. It was as genuine as that. And so we began to share whether it was a living room floor that had a bunch of green shag carpeting on it. From I can from picture the, it. You described it. Yeah. So from the seventies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and not much furniture, but you know, there's some rug you can sit on it. We can, Mm-hmm. you know, we can have a Bible study or we can just come and sit and talk to each other. We we just started hosting uh, musicians who were from out of town that needed to come and rehearse. So as naturally as that, it was about response, gratitude and response. And then it grew and that just grew and grew in every house we lived in. And then we moved from California to Nashville and it grew exponentially because then everybody wanted to come and visit and needed a place to stay. And then we together, we bought an old country church with a vision of having a place where artists, but then it grew from there. It began as a place for artists to come and um, have teaching and fellowship and community in an actual place that was a very interesting place and that we were kind of coming into the history of that place. And we were only in our young 30s at that time. And uh, so we started this work. It was called The Art House. And uh, a few years later, we moved our family into that building and began to make that our home. We began to renovate and we had a recording studio and we hosted things for uh, a larger community, but we also began to have a lot of dinner guests and overnight guests and guests for the week and people who are making music there and this whole idea of having this place and have and having a work of hospitality it just grew and it grew small and it grew large and it grew for years and I found that I found my gifts inside of that I found my gifts as I responded as people were hungry and I kept learning more and more and more about food and kind of expanding my repertoire and my you know, my recipes and my experience and also growing in really uh, uh, just the experience of having relationships and understanding that people needed the same thing I needed, which was attention and care and uh, conversation and, you know, inspiration and how all of those things would, and, you know, and that beauty mattered. It mattered a lot to me as I went to people's places that had beauty to offer. I was already a gardener, but I became much, much more of a gardener as we created this place. So all of these things were coming together and family life was right in the midst of it all. And I just really grew to understand relationships are just center for me. They're just center. And I, uh, have a lot of joy and had a lot of joy as I got to know people and as we would sit around the table and have that beauty of table fellowship that could be really really simple it could just be people from the studio coming in you know on a break and sitting together and eating together it could be 
different than that, more than that. And, uh, but I found all these components that were important to me that God was placing in me to learn about and love and respond to and grow in expertise and experience. And uh, so it's the particularities that were given to me, you know, but that also are kind of human need oriented as well. Food and shelter, very, very basic relationship, very, very basic. And then we all have, you know, the ways that we're given in our place and our, in our city and our whatever gifts we have to live these things out in a different ways. But Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's the way they grew for me i love the intention of the life that you built and and again you know really anyone listening watching this you need to read the book because i'm sure as you were listening to andy there were questions about but wait tell us more about this or this or that well it's all in the book so you really want to read it really it's mm -hmm. just really amazing andy um you define in the book success and I heard you, having read the chapter, having listened to you and, and hearing you, you've what you've described here is in a way your definition of success. And I, just like I was telling Charlie how I loved the quote on, you know, God's love being basically completely gracious and unconditional in the same way, I define success as delighting in God. A yeah. day that has been spent where you have delighted in God in whatever shape or form it takes in French. Mm -hmm. um, so I use French a lot, right? So in French, we have the word delight is delice, which in English would be delicious. Because mm -hmm. in French, we, you have two words. Mm -hmm. You have delight and deliciousness. In French, these two words are both the same word, delice. We don't make a difference between delight and deliciousness, which is why we mm -hmm. like food, which I is why that. this is called gospel spice. And which is why, Andy, I love your you know your recipes <laughs> and your cooking ministry because in french god is both delightful and delicious it's mm -hmm. one thing no wonder scripture says to taste and see that the lord is good it's the same thing so that's how i would define success and your definition of success would you tell us what it has to do with fruitfulness which has to do with food again so tell us in <laughs> <laughs> yes um i just think it's 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 where i want to set my compass you know, it's very, I mean, we're caught up in it right now because we have a book, right? So anytime you're putting something out in the world, all of a sudden you are, you are confronted with what are the numbers mm -hmm. yes. and you have, yeah. so it's not something you can really escape, but I want a bigger vision of what a good life is and I think that Jesus has given that to us as he describes the fruit that he will make in our lives. Mm. And um so it's fruitfulness. And I I learned that just kind of those those two things, you know, is it, is it does successful really capture a human life as God sees it? And uh Success is so often used in terms of numbers, metrics, how you count the value of a human life. And I think this beautiful word fruitfulness, you know, being in the vine and uh, just give, being given the life that God, God's the one who can make fruit and we get to participate, mm -hmm. but we can't measure it. That's not our job to do is to measure it or to see the eternal, to see even, uh, you know, to try and say, well, that was a fruitful thing we did today. It's, it's not, it's not our work. And so it, it freezes up, it frees us up to be people who can do the things that God brings into our life to do, to be with the people he, he gives us to be with, to use our gifts and to say, Lord, these are the things you've given you know, help us to follow you in them, to kind of have this open palm life, like two hands out to God. We're pilgrims, we're followers, we're following you. Lead us and guide us, good shepherd. And then I think there's such a rest and a trust and a beauty in that, that, uh, yeah, that's, and, and then there's a particular scripture that I came to in my older 
life that was, uh, it's uh, Psalm 92, a little portion. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. And that to me was, again, a promise that it's always God who's renewing us, who's making us able, who's leading us on, and uh, the fruitfulness is his. And we get the joy and the delight of participating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And from now on, it's all just going to be delicious. That's, gonna, That's right. I'm and just going to say everything. I'm just going to, ah, it's just delicious. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Sure. And now, a brief message from Gospel Spice. Did you know that Gospel Spice has a library of in-depth Bible studies available online for free? Discover our previous podcast studies on your own or with friends and enjoy exclusive content that includes listening guides for each teaching episode, study questions, verses to memorize, tips, and more. Just visit gospelspice.com and click on the studies tab. Now back to the podcast. Now, back to the video. Charlie, how do you see the mystery of God at work in the life of Andy bearing fruit? Um, I really see, for, for me, Andy is always a... A sign and symbol of um, trust, and um, because at the heart of our striving, or at the heart of measuring ourselves or um, comparing ourselves to our neighbors, or experiencing disappointment because we're at number 22 on the chart instead of number one or whatever it is. I, I think that God has given me this beautiful partner who uh, by the spirit has a true trust that God is enough and that the, the gift of the relationship that she was invited into is enough and that that no matter how many people write books or do podcasts that come up with the next latest greatest best you know path to god <laughs> that somehow she has already figured it out you know so um that is a mystery that I have to return to again and again. And partially because of that is that even though we've lived our life together in what is functionally that, you know, among entertainment corporations, um, I've been the point person. So I've been out there, I've been the perpetrator and the victim, you know, and I know that world inside and out. I know what it feels like to feel like, you know, you're not good enough. Your your numbers aren't good enough. You're too old. You put on too much weight. You know, whatever it is. And there's a hundred different um, metrics in the entertainment industry. And probably most profound is how much it is the polar opposite of God's great generosity in that even if you've been the, to the mountaintop a thousand times, you're only as good as the last time you went. You're only as good as your last great story. And uh, that kind of pressure on people, um, I don't even know how people do it without having this counter narrative that the gospel is. I mean, if I didn't have that counter narrative and have a person in my life, like Andy, who keeps coming back to, you know, the fundamentals uh, and because she's living it, not because she's saying, hey, you need to you need to come back to the fundamentals. It's just like I just have to look at her and listen to her. Um, yeah, I don't even know how I, I would survive it. It's it's just it's so absurd, you know, and, and ridiculous and non delicious. <laughs> 
Yeah, not very delightful, any of those things. Um, <laughs> and and in spite, and, and you know, you, you share very openly in the book. And it's another thing I love and, and why I've really enjoyed sitting at your feet and, and trying to soak up as much of the wisdom of your inside your book as possible, because you're so vulnerable and open and, and you really don't mind sharing all of the foibles and failures because, because you understand grace. Because that does not alter your perception of your identity and how God really sees you. And that's what's that's freedom again. Um, and so in spite of the tremendous successes you've had uh, in all of the definitions of the word, um, you, Charlie, are battling with chronic pain and migraines. And, and I relate to that. I have migraines. I have some measure of chronic pain. Um, you describe a nervous breakdown that you had, that you're still living the consequences of. Would you give a word to someone listening or watching who is going through something a little similar to that? Yes. Um, one of the the this not everyone reacts this way but i would say the majority of people react this way with chronic pain and really debilitating pain is there's a tendency to really close in um and um you just you want to figure out how to get yourself small enough <laughs> that somehow <laughs> You know, if you shrink down and you have the least amount of contact with people and least amount of contact with the world, that somehow the the pain will reduce and you'll you'll be able to you know maybe you'll just pass out you know and have some relief. And there's uh, I've you know not only have I experienced this, but I've had it expl explained to me you know by by numerous um, neurologists and books and in person and. And it, but in reality, um, the the remedy that that we so often need is we just need a few safe people to which we can say exactly what it is. You know, we don't have to uh, be performative in any way. We can just. Um, just tell it exactly like it is. And then they don't try to fix us and they don't judge us. They just let us be. And once you've experienced that a few times, then you can live in the spectrum of your ups and downs of, of the chronic pain. And every time that you're like at your worst, it doesn't have to be this, you know, okay, now I have to tell them all again what's happening, you know, and, and, um, and that's, I feel, is probably the best advice that I was given is just to have a few people in your life. Obviously, Andy is is a, is the key person for me, but also to have talked to my children about it. Um, my children have participated in my recovery, taking me to the doctor, have been a part of, even my daughter went with me in my first um, ketamine treatment session that I did um, so, and then we then our closest friends they know about it too, um, and and then you can begin to like for me and I'm sure for you as well we we all develop. If, I think the the first inclination is like, let me just sort of go for everything and try to see if I can find anything that gives me any relief, right? So is it Tylenol or acupuncture or uh, cross training or whatever it is? You know, you you run the gamut of of all of those things, and then we eventually kind of get our menu. And you know, having read the book, you know I describe what my my menu is. You know, so I've gone from being a person that was it, as if the headache wasn't debilitating enough, the medication, you know, was triply debilitating so i've gone from being a person who was non-functional at one point uh, because of all the medication that i was on um, to being where i'm largely medication free uh, today and uh, just use some uh, simple wellness techniques uh, to moderate the pain but i live with chronic pain every every day 
but I don't live in the culture of chronic pain. That's, that's absolutely key, isn't it? Because it's a mindset shift that really changes everything. It's like grace. Once you've integrated it, it really changes everything. Even if on the outside, the pain, whether it be spiritual in the case of grace or physical in the case of chronic yes. pain, um, yes. it's kind of the same thing. You're, you're experiencing an embodied form of grace. Yes. Yes. And I, I first experienced this with uh, tinnitus, which I have in my left ear. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that preceded my uh, neurological breakdown. And um, the tinnitus used to be so loud. It was, it was like, I literally thought I was going to go crazy. Um, I was so panicky from it. And now, most of the time, I don't really hear it. When I lay down at night or wake up in the morning, sometimes it'll be more profound. Um, but it's as if I, I know I have it. I know it's there. I know I have some hearing loss in that ear. But I it doesn't demand my attention mm -hmm. as much. And the headache, um, and I have a lot of other symptoms as well, but... They don't demand my attention until they reach a certain threshold. And that's sort of like just a part, I think, where we all, all have a threshold of, of our own smallness and weakness and brokenness. And there you kind of just get to the point like, you know what, everybody, I love you, but I got to go to bed. Yeah. I got to put on one of my cold you know, caps and and uh you know take some emergency med and just get in bed and listen yeah. to a book on you know yeah. Yeah. audible or something i like your perspective you know you were saying you know it's a reminder of our smallness and our weakness and this isn't in some kind of you know worm theology you're really just saying hey i remember scripturally yes. speaking that i am dust and that's yes. just the 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 embodied manifestation <laughs> of that um, you, there's a term you use, both of you, in the book. Uh, you call it too muchness. So Andy, uh, Andy, in light of everything we've talked about, hospitality and, you know, chronic pain and all of the things and, you know, how to have a Christian voice that you don't necessarily call Christian in the world today. What is too muchness and any advice about that? Well, too muchness has meant different things for me. Of course, I'm 68 now, so I've had, you know, decades of experiencing that in different places and different times of life. And uh, I think we we both felt it very mm -hmm. much uh, in our 25 years of living in the art house and doing so much hosting and, you know, having so many different parts to our life that were big and ongoing and um so we would always we would always come together and say how can we have a more sustainable vocation how can we have a more sustainable life that we we're just not feeling this pressure and so much of it was self-induced pressure you know so sometimes we have a favorite place that that we have been to a few times and if you've never been there you would you would love it anybody would love it it's called laity lodge and it is a retreat center in the hill country of texas and we just we both remember sometimes we would go there we'd just be so filled by the peace and the people and the great teaching and the place itself and floating in the river on inner tubes and we would pray lord help us to leave this place and come to more wisdom on this topic of how to have less self-induced pressure and tension and strain and we can, you know, we can, so we'd make good choices and then we'd, we'd get caught up again. But I think uh, some of the things that helped us were just, they're so basic, but we, we have the more ability in our life to put in practice, uh, having some boundaries around 
what we say yes to and what we say no to. And I know that we've always had that. We've always had that choice. But uh, I think we we understand that we need to make that choice, even now as we're, you know, older and we do have this, both have chronic pain and we just feel our limitations more. And uh, we've always had them. Everybody has them. It's very human. I think that is the wonderful thing to understand is that God has made the world. He has made us. He has made human lives with limitations, 24 hour days, the need to sleep, the need to have not just one thing that overtakes you all the time, but to have play, to have friendships, to have uh, delighting in the people around you, to have take walks, smell the flowers, you know, just take these small things and breathe them into your being and say, thank you, Lord. I'm noticing, I'm paying attention. I see that. I hear that bird. I see this flower in bloom that's going to bloom this one time in all, in all of, all of this year, it's going to bloom right now. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to pay attention to it and I'm going to be thankful for it. And I'm going to take in the beauty and be nourished by it. Um, Sabbath is really important. The principle of, you know, the one day out of seven to have an other kind of day. And, uh, that's been important to learn and to to put in practice, but never perfectly. And I think that's always our kind of our mantra throughout the book is we do everything is proximate, never perfectly done. There's always grace. That's where we live. Our standing is in grace. So that's where we, you know, we just we're not going to get anything perfect, including having our Sabbath day. Yeah. or our boundaries or our you know all those things but we're we're always learning and trying to uh, I guess be healthier in in all the ways that there are to be healthy and, but we're always on but we're still on the road we're always on the road yeah. indeed the uh you use the word proximate a lot in the book and I, I think it's mm -hmm. a good word to anchor our faith on because it's not nothing we do is perfect even with God you know working through us and when we are his hands and feet in so many different ways it's yeah. never perfect including um and and Charlie I'm going to turn to you as we are wrapping up a little bit here um probably my favorite I had a hard time picking a favorite not that I need to pick a favorite chapter in the book but I was like okay like which ones do I really want to share with my husband who doesn't read nearly as much as I do? Like which ones mm -hmm. can't share the whole thing. And one I'm definitely going to share with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie, you wrote about um, talking about Jesus in the public square and mm -hmm. talking about, you know, proximate work. That's definitely probably way up top the list. And you use an expression I love that you call the hope of humble explicitness. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that, please? Yes. Um, well, first, I want to give props to our friend Stephen Garber, um, who we got um, the um, term proximate in its application that we use in the book uh, from. And he's actually writing uh, a whole book on, on the topic. So watch for that in the future. Um, but yeah, he really inspired us uh, many years ago now uh, to make that a part of our vocabulary and a part of our theological understanding of, of the way life is put together. So in, in the same way that, that Steve's term or Stephen Garber's term proximate became so important to us, uh, as I was thinking about writing and speaking again in the public square, because I'd taken some time off from it, I, I was like, I really need, I need some words. Uh, I need an anchor, you know, to start uh, to sort of build this on a foundation. And and as I played with words a bit, I, I came up with this idea of, okay, 
uh, what does it mean to be explicit in terms of uh, Christian um, profession, declaration, and then using language that is associated uh, with uh, the history of Christianity? And then what does it mean to do that in a humble way? And I meant for the humility part to also encompass words like empathy and um, and curiosity for others and listening to others. And um, so that became the foundation for me to, to begin thinking about what would it be to write again and to to put that out into the public square. And from there, the next piece that sort of fell into place was the idea that, well, it would be then this humble explicitness in my writing would be shaped by someone, anyone, anywhere in the world looking over my shoulder or listening in. And then that brought me to the idea that like, well, yes, because of the internet, there are no hidden rooms anymore. There's no back rooms. There's like everything is the front room, right? Everyone enters in. And so that really took me down the road of, of doing even more work than I had already done on how I articulate ideas, how I write how I take um, uh, ideas that are foundational Christian theological ideas and reframe them in ways that make sense to me as an artist and also make sense to me as a neighbor, uh, to any neighbor who may or may not profess to follow Christ. So that was, that was really the, um, when I was, thinking about those ideas, which was probably over 10 years ago now, uh, that was just kind of a refreshing a moment when I came back to it. I had done a lot of thinking about it, but then it was like, okay, this is really important again. I had no idea how important it would become come 2015 <laughs> and, <laughs> and all the way up to now that it would be uh, really an essential skill set uh, for navigating the public life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, your entire book, I feel, is soaked in a sense of holy expectancy towards your reader. So what's something you are hoping to generate in the reader through this, through your collection of letters? Mm. One of you answer that maybe briefly as we're running out of time. Gosh, uh, let's see. rip some words. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have well, encouragement, yeah, yeah. encouragement, uh, inspiration in terms of, yeah, how to envision your life as this beautiful gift that God has given you, and that all of the parts, the small things that are hidden and unseen, matter to God, matter to you in your lifetime. Um, matter to us your matter neighbor. to us your neighbor your friend your family we, member we see you and we hope you see us yeah um even the hidden quiet work of the church being the church yeah. of the family Without being any the fanfare. family just all, no advertising yeah no advertising no bullet point you know no big yeah. billboards or social media posts but just the good and quiet work of all these different threads that make up a life in, uh, in Jesus and that goes out to love our neighbors mm -hmm. as we love ourselves. It's big, and yet it's very particular, and we all have a different part to play. Yeah. So, yeah. That is why everything that doesn't matter matters so much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Angie Ashworth and Charlie Peacock, I could keep on asking questions and talking with you, but um, we need to end here. So thank you so, so much for your time, for your heart, for taking the time and having the imagination to create these letters for us. They will be treasured. I know that. 
I've learned so much from, again, from your wisdom, from your humility. I've truly learned a lot. So thank you so thank much. You. And thank you for I have, the encouragement. I am in love with God more as a result of mm. putting him through your eyes through the course mm. of this. So thank you for that. Oh, that's a really beautiful blessing. Thank mm. you, Stephanie. And now, a brief message from Gospel Spice. Do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start? Take our podcasting one-on-one course with Stephanie Roussel, who shares with you her knowledge and tips to take your podcast from concept to reality. This three-hour webinar is extremely practical and hands-on, providing you with the information that you need to start a podcast in just 30 days. Plus, the fee for this course is invested back to Gospel Spice. It's like your money gets multiplied. You get top-notch coaching by helping us spread the gospel. Go to gospelspice.com slash podcasting for the details. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Merci. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you are the first to know when we release a new video or episode. Also, would you please consider helping us reach new people with the good news of the spice of the gospel by leaving a five-star review for the Gospel Spice podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, etc.? Finally, share and follow us on social media to spread the word of Gospel Spice. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to tune in our podcast with new episodes every Friday. I'll see you in our next video very soon right here. Merci.